evening, everybody. I guess there's not, while I'm wearing a mic, it's not for the, the room, so I hope you can all hear me okay. Is everything okay? Um, like Megan said, my name is Franny Skimerski. I am a geologist at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory with a soft spot for nuclear energy. Uh, during tonight's presentation, we're gonna talk about the role of geology in the nuclear fuel cycle. And just to make sure that we're both on the same page here, I just wanna start with the what is geology question. I've put this picture of the Earth from space up here just to kind of tickle your minds, but what do you guys think of when you think of geology? Rocks. Rocks. <laughs> Anything else? No. That's it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'll just put a few more things up here. Anything from mapping rocks, like the audience suggested, to understanding the movement of continents over geologic time, to volcanoes and earthquakes, to understanding the Earth and its past, for instance, when dinosaurs roamed the planet, um, one of the coolest things I think about geology is if you understand the rocks on Earth, you can also understand the rocks on other planets. It's very transferable to other regions of the solar system. Um, geology encompasses everything from mining for precious metals to mining for uranium to mining for oil and natural gas. And of course, there is a large environmental component. And I put the iceberg up there to talk about understanding changes in climate over geologic history. And we all know, based on last year's events in Japan, that it's extremely important to understand geology, such as the occurrence of earthquakes when we're talking about nuclear energy. Um, this is kind of the view that was introduced to me when I decided to major in geology as an undergrad. But I never in a million years imagined that my career path would take me to working along uh, the nuclear fuel side of things. But I must say, it's one of the most interesting rides I've been on, and I wouldn't have it any other way. So just to make sure that we're all on the same page about the nuclear fuel cycle, I put up this schematic just to get you thinking about it. What do you guys think about when you, when you hear the word cycle? Or, what's that? Life, life, okay, absolutely. Nuclear energy does help support us in our everyday endeavors. But also, it implies that something can go round and round and round. While nuclear energy is considered a non-renewable energy resource because uranium, the uranium from the ground is finite, um, we can do a lot to help sustain uh, the use of it within our own lifetimes. So in the next slide, I'm going to just walk you through it a little bit. And then during tonight's presentation, I'm hoping that you'll walk away with an understanding of how geology plays a key role in different parts of the nuclear fuel cycle. So when we're talking about nuclear energy, the uranium that we burn in a reactor has to come from somewhere. And so there's a natural link between geology and the nuclear fuel cycle here, where it comes from figuring out where uranium deposits are on Earth's surface. But the uranium that comes out of the ground is not something we can stick directly into a reactor. We have to do some refinement of it to enrich it in a certain isotope of uranium, which I'll talk about in a few slides from now. And then we put those, um, we put that uranium into fuel. Does anyone, has anyone heard of Arriva? or maybe people work at Arriva. Okay, a few hands. So Arriva is a nuclear fuel fabrication plant on the north end of Richland. Um, so they do this type of stuff right in our own backyard. And uh, then we actually burn the fuel in the reactor and get electricity from that. And then geology plays a very important role on what we call the back end of the fuel cycle, which is what do we do with the fuel when it comes out of the reactor? We have two options, and I'll discuss both of those. One is take the fuel and stick it into a geologic repository, such as Yucca Mountain, which was what was working was being worked towards as our nation's uh, nuclear uh, waste repository, or we can <clears throat> extend the life of that material that comes out of the reactor by making it into new fuel, and that's called reprocessing. And we do work related to all parts of the nuclear fuel cycle at the lab. Um, in the next few slides, we're gonna get into what goes on inside of a nuclear reactor, and what I really want you guys to be able to walk away with tonight is 
one, an understanding for how nuclear um, energy is, or how electricity from nuclear uh, chain reactions are generated. Um, I also want you to uh, walk away with an appreciation of how geology plays an important role in each of these parts of the fuel cycle. Okay, and I may be preaching to the choir, I may not, but the question is, why do we need nuclear energy in today's world? Well, what we see here along the bottom is an example of a hydroelectric plant, an example of solar energy, an example of wind energy. We can, we can sure see a number of wind farms that are going up around the mid-Columbia Valley region. Um, and these fall into the renewable category because there's an ample source of wind, there's an ample source of sunlight. Um, and then here up here we have coal, we have nuclear, and we have things like oil and natural gas that fall into the non-renewable energy sector. Uh, but out of all of these uh, non-renewable energies, um, nuclear energy is one of the few that can produce electricity on demand without generating a significant amount of carbon dioxide. And we'll talk more about this in the next few slides. But one of the hurdles to nuclear energy is to demonstrate that we can safely and effectively deal with the nuclear waste that we generate from it. And so we're going to also talk about what we intend to do with that. And um, I hope you'll walk away understanding just what comes out of a nuclear reactor after tonight's presentation. So <clears throat> let's start with the question. <laughs> Do you know what percentage of our nation's electricity comes from nuclear energy? And I'm talking electricity, not um, energy as a whole, because it doesn't include driving cars, OK? So do you think we're up at 40%, 30%, 20 or 10? I'll take a show of hands for 40%. Oh, OK. How about 10%? OK, a few, it's OK, OK. 30%? Uh, 30% and 20%? Whoa, hey. <laughs> All right, well, I guess it's a democratic question because the majority has it. <laughs> um, this is actually the breakdown of the electricity generation for the United States. You can see that nuclear is sitting here at 20%. Coal is at 50% um, because it's actually quite abundant in the United States proper. Uh, we have natural gas, which burns more cleanly than coal, just a little under 20%. Um, hydroelectric at seven. Oil is a very small fraction for electricity and heating. And then you can see that the sliver here makes up 3%, that's solar, wind, biomass, et cetera. That's not a lot. It is growing, but it still has a long way to go in order to catch up with the mainstays like coal and nuclear. Now, let's focus in on the state of Washington a little bit more. Do you guys think that Washington state is above or below the national average, national average for using nuclear energy? Oh, we have a mixed audience. OK, cool. That's good. <laughs> well, the actual answer is that we're below because we have quite amount of our electricity that's derived from hydroelectric power. And that's rare. Not all states have the luxury of using hydroelectric power. But if you look in our own backyards, we have the Columbia, the Snake, and the Yakima. And here's just a picture of Grand Coulee up in northern Washington. So we're kind of a unique situation. It's good to have too many energy re or electrical resources, I would say, rather than too few. I come from Illinois, which has the highest number of nuclear reactors in the, in the lower 48 states, or in all 50 states, I should say. OK, well, when you're driving around town, you might have noticed that if you look to the north, you see some steam plumes coming from the Columbia Generating Station. That is, in fact, the state of Washington's only nuclear power plant. That's not to say it's its only nuclear reactor, but it's its only nuclear power plant that's currently operating to generate electricity. Um, Washington State has a unique history related to the Manhattan Project. I won't be touching too much on that tonight. But uh, as you can see, we have a surplus, a surplus of plutonium stored at the Hanford site, which most states do not have. <laughs> we have a Department of Energy-owned spent nuclear fuel and high-level waste, which I will talk a little bit about later. And over in Washington State, we have Washington, or 
sorry, over in Pullman, we have Washington State University, which has a research reactor that does some excellent nuclear-related work. And I just want to talk a little bit about what goes on in a reactor. So just so we're all talking about the same thing, nuclear fission is essentially the breaking apart of an unstable nucleus. Uranium-235 is our friend that I'll be talking about quite a bit tonight. Um, it absorbs a neutron, and then it bursts apart into two smaller nuclei called fission products, releasing more neutrons and energy as heat in the process. So let's take a minute and talk about the difference between a controlled versus an uncontrolled reaction. A controlled reaction is what happens in a nuclear power plant, for instance, when we want to have a continuous generation of neutrons, but we want to keep the reaction under control so that we don't have neutrons just being generated out of con um, without uh, containment. So we use things called control rods uh, to help absorb neutrons that we don't want to set off other um, fissionable material. So I like to do a demonstration to um, illustrate the difference between a controlled and an uncontrolled reactor. So this is going to be involving a little audience participation here. So you might want to scooch in just a few seats. Okay. <laughs> so I'm asking, I'm going to ask you guys to put your, your fingers out like this. Not quite like you're meditating, but almost. <laughs> okay. And then the two gentlemen on the end, <laughs> here and here, I just want you to touch your neighbor's finger. And when you do, say now when, when that person touches your finger. And then continue on just one at a time, touching your neighbor's finger until everybody's finger has been touched. <laughs> Keep going, keep going. <laughs> OK, so we just about made it to the back of the room here. And we have what I would say is a confused controlled reaction, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> but you can see that. You know, it's very controlled, one at a time, now, 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 now. You can hear everyone's voice, right? So that's what's going on inside a nuclear reactor, for instance. In contrast, if your goal is to generate as many neutrons and release as much heat and energy as you can in a very short amount of time, we have what's called an uncontrolled chain reaction. And to illustrate that, I want you to take note of the decibel level. and. If the gentleman in the green jacket here in the middle would also do the same, and Troy, would you, would you mind doing the same, being our starting point? <laughs> what I want you now to do is touch two of your neighbors, and every time you get touched, touch two other people, and just note the sound difference. OK? Go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I heard a lot more now, I don't know about you guys. <laughs> and it progressed a lot faster than the controlled chain reaction, right? So that just illustrates how in an uncontrolled chain reaction, every neutron hits another nucleus that splits and creates more neutrons. It's like throwing a ping pong ball into a room full of mouse traps, and if each mouse trap had a ping pong ball on it, it would set off other mouse traps and it goes very quickly. Okay, so that's control versus uncontrolled fission. All right. Well, back to the controlled fission. This is what is going on inside one type of nuclear reactor. This is a boiling water reactor. Here is the core. This is where our nuclear fuel would be. And because of the fission process that's going on, it's releasing heat. And that heat uh, turns the water that comes in contact with the um, fuel into steam. That steam turns a turbine and gets cooled and then goes back to the core. So this is what we call a boiling water reactor. And when that turbine turns, it generates electricity that we use in our houses, buildings, and schools. Now, this scenario could be uh, the same for a coal-fired power plant, for instance, something a natural gas power plant. Anything that has a heat source and can turn a turbine can generate electricity. Same as a wind turbine, right? Except we just don't need the heat source. The wind is our energy source, essentially. So this is how we're generating electricity using nuclear materials. So 
I want to talk a minute about what nuclear fuel is exactly, because this is going to uh, be important for when we're talking about what materials we get from the Earth itself. So in general, we use a uranium-based fuel cycle. And so the fuel that goes into a reactor is a combination of uranium and oxygen. It's a solid. And as you can see here, there's two isotopes, which are atoms of the same element, but they have a different atomic mass. So we need uranium-238, which is the most common in nature. It's, 99, it's more than 99% of the type of uranium that you would pull out of a ground. And we also need uranium-235, which is more rare in nature. Uranium-235 exists in less than 1% if we were to dig a piece of uranium-bearing mineral out of the ground. So we actually have to go through a number of steps in order to enrich it to a point that we can sustain a nuclear reaction in a uh, nuclear reactor, for instance. And here, I brought these little simulated fuel pellets, don't worry, they're not radioactive, <laughs> from uh, the American Nuclear Society. And they just basically show you what size a nuclear fuel um, pellet is. And these would be stacked inside a nuclear fuel rod here that has a coating, a zirconium aluminum alloy coating. And then these rods are made into an assembly, and these assemblies are uh, lowered into the nuclear reactor core, and they can be in there for a number of years until the uranium-235 is used up, at which point they get shuffled around and they get um, replaced with fresh fuel material. So this is actually what goes into a nuclear reactor. So this brings us to the question of, well, how does geology play a role, and what does uranium look like when it comes out of the ground? Well. This is an example of a mineral on the right-hand side called uraninite, which is basically nature's UO2. Um, it has a lot more impurities because the uranium has been decaying over geologic time. So there's other elements that you have to extract out of there. And then oftentimes you get a yellow colored mineral, um, a uranium-6 plus mineral, because uranium is very easily oxidized in uh, the Earth's surface environment. So, that's what it would look like, though, if you were to pull some uranium out of the ground. And the yellow, I, like, I would like to liken to uh, rust, OK? We all know what happens when your car's out in the winter and the snow and the, and the salt on the road. That nice, shiny exterior you have turns to a brownish, reddish rust because it's reacting with water and oxygen. Maybe that happens more in Chicago than it happens here, but <laughs> that's what's going on. And if you look at the surface of a rusted material, you see all these um, pock marks and, and alteration phases. Where are uranium deposits in the world? Well, the answer is they're on every continent. Maybe not Antarctica, actually. But um, they're found, the world's top producer is currently Australia, followed by Kazakhstan, and then our neighbor to the north, Canada. However, uh, the United States has a long history of uranium production. Um, the Colorado Plateau is famous for uranium resources, so is areas such as Grants, New Mexico, for instance. But even just up 395 here, if you were to go uh, northwest of Spokane, there is a uranium mine that's not in operation uh, currently, but it was, it was called the Midnight Uranium Mine. And there they mined a uranium phosphate mineral from the ground. But just to give you an idea, there are uranium deposits all over the world, including in our own backyard. OK, so we've talked a little bit about where the uranium comes from. And we talked about what goes on inside a reactor. And now let's take a look at what nuclear fuel is when it comes out of a reactor, because this plays an important role in how we deal with it for the long run. So what is nuclear waste exactly? Well, if we're talking about the commercial fuel, this is nuclear waste when it comes out of a reactor. 
it is these fuel bundles. Inside, they are still 95% uranium dioxide. However, that material, that uranium-235 that we worked so hard to enrich, um, has split into smaller elements called fission products, and uh, they make up the other 5%, as well as um, materials or elements such as Uranium, well, <laughs> sorry, uranium absorbs a neutron to form neptunium and plutonium, for instance. So the word plutonium might set off some warning bells in your mind. And we used the uranium fuel cycle, but it was born out of the uranium weapons program that came out of the Manhattan Project in the 1940s. But that's generated as well as the fission products, such as, um, hmm? strontium and technetium, as well as xenon, iodine, and cesium. Along the base here are different um, elements, and along here is how much uh, is produced inside a nuclear reactor. As you can see, it has this unique bimodal distribution, but this is the nature of the fission products, the smaller nuclei that uranium splits into when it uh, undergoes fission. OK, so what do we do with this solid spent nuclear fuel, as it's called, when it comes out of a reactor? Well, we have two choices. One, we can follow the open fuel cycle, which is what we currently do in the United States, which means that the fuel comes out of a reactor, it's stored in cooling pools at different reactor sites all around the country, and ultimately, that fuel will go to a geologic repository. Or we could have a closed fuel cycle where we take the fuel that comes out of the reactor, we dissolve it, we extract the usable materials, such as the uranium, and also we can burn plutonium as a nuclear fuel, and we make new fuel out of the old fuel. And that's called a closed fuel cycle. France uses the closed nuclear fuel cycle. They're very good at reprocessing. Japan sends its fuel to other countries to help close the nuclear fuel cycle. There is still material that has to be stored geologically for a long time to um, make sure it doesn't interact with the general population. But it's a much smaller amount of material than um, just sticking fuel bundles directly into the Earth's crust. And so essentially here on that nuclear fuel cycle map, you can see we can either go straight to a geologic repository or we can dissolve the fuel, make new fuel, and use that in a reactor. So those are important terms that you might, uh, you might hear down the road. So what happens then if we actually dissolve the nuclear fuel? Well, um, like I said, this can lead to new fuel or nuclear weapons, so that's why it's really important to keep an eye on who's actually reprocessing the fuel around the world. But uh, I'll just link it back to the Hanford site. Um, during World War II, we were interested in manufacturing plutonium, and so we did reprocess. We dissolved our fuel very soon after it came out of the reactor. We extracted the plutonium, and then we ended up with a number of high-level waste tanks, high-level waste being material that's radioactive that comes from the weapons program. So this is the subject of another talk entirely, <laughs> but um, we can address some questions related to that later if you have any. What would we do with liquid high-level waste? Well, one of the things that's proposed is to vitrify it. Have you guys heard of the vitrification plant that they're working on at the Hanford site? OK, that means basically taking all this liquid material with uh, radioactive elements dissolved in it um, and mixing it with a silica, like a sand frit and then you turn it into glass waste logs. Why is that good? You can put a lot of this radioactive material into those glass waste logs. It can, glass can also host a lot of different elements. Glass is also radiation resistant, which is really important when you're thinking of a nuclear waste form. But because glass does not have a specific crystalline structure, over time it may um, separate out into different phases, which uh, may, uh, limit the durability of the glass. But it is a very good solution if you have a high volume of waste that you're trying to stabilize, and it's much easier to deal with a solid than it is a liquid over long time periods. So that's why we're going the vitrification route. Um, 
And this is what a glass log would look like, just to give you a scale. Uh, that's me, so about five feet. <laughs> um, and that's just a mock-up, because I wouldn't be here talking to you if it was a real radioactive log. <laughs> but uh, this is a mock-up of a waste container outside of Yucca Mountain in Nevada. That's not the only option, however. And this is where geology plays another interesting role in the nuclear fuel cycle. We can learn a lot from nature, actually. And if you just go out in the field and you start collecting different minerals, you're going to find that they have trace amounts of uranium in them, of uh, thorium in them, which are large cations um, that we also associate with the nuclear fuel cycle. And so we look and see what element or what minerals out there can host these large elements. And we can learn from them, and we can actually make materials that have similar properties to these naturally occurring ones. And they actually um, can be uh, tailored to have good resistance to leaching in the presence of water. Um, they can also, we can also see which ones have good uh, radiation tolerance. And essentially, we can look at nature to understand how we can develop waste forms for specific elements like plutonium and uranium and other uh, fission products that we would want to stabilize um, over long periods of time. And one that I want to talk about in particular is not fluorite, which is here. This is calcium fluoride. Um, it's the state mineral of Illinois. It also has the same atomic structure, essentially, as uranium dioxide, which goes into a nuclear fuel material. But just to give you an example, there's a version, that, a, a version of the fluorite structure that can be substituted with both actinide elements like plutonium. And you could also substitute in good um, neutron absorbing elements. And um, if you substitute both of those things, you can have very high waste loading. And you can have a material that won't go critical over long periods of time. And you can have something that has good radiation resistance and good uh, resistance to leaching. So just by looking at what's out there in nature, we can learn a lot um, about how to effectively deal with our nuclear waste materials. OK, so this is where we're at. We have the nuclear fuel rods that come out of the reactor, that's spent fuel. We have this high level waste that we can turn into glass logs. And these are the two ideal solid phases that we can put into um, a permanent storage location. So I just wanted to bring these up because this is um, where geology and the nuclear fuel cycle really come together. And so what I just want you guys to have a chance to think about what would you do if someone handed you a bunch of nuclear waste, let's say the solid fuel bundles and this high level radioactive waste, what do you think is the best thing to do with it? And keep in mind that these materials have very long half-lives. Uranium decays at a rate of um, <laughs> one decay over 4.6 billion years, so it's a really long time. <laughs> or sorry, half the uranium in the room would decay in 4.6 billion years, which is the same age of the Earth. Um, it's highly radioactive. We can't handle it directly. And it's a solid. So I'll, I'll just give you a minute to talk to your neighbor about what, what, what would you do <laughs> with nuclear waste. Don't be shy. <laughs> Any volunteers? You put it on the moon. Well, thank you for that suggestion. <laughs> Anybody else a little more terrestrial, perhaps? Can you uh, pick places where things are sort of getting piled up on it? Like, for example, could you put it at the end of a uh, river delta where it, uh, it's just going to get, get piled continually up? buried? Yes, an area of natural deposition. That's not a bad thought. Anything else? OK, well. You guys are right on par with what was suggested many, many years ago as the National Academy of Sciences was brainstorming. It actually came up, the idea of burying at the bottom of the ocean, whether it's in a trench 
uh, subduction zone trench or in an area that would have a lot of deposition that we wouldn't have to deal with it again in the near future. Um, storing waste in ice caps was also brought up, which is always a little funny to me because you might actually melt the surrounding ice cap if you did that. But <laughs> um, and the idea of sending it into outer space has also been <laughs> suggested not just in this room, but <laughs> in other venues as well. But each of these things have their own pros and cons. Uh, for launching it into space, there is a high risk associated with space launches and with the volume of waste we have, that would be a lot of trips to the moon, if you will. Um, Storing nuclear waste in ice caps, that would be good. You just have to have a good way to keep an eye on it because while we call it waste, it could be used down the line. It could be something that we want to make into new fuel ultimately. Um, and so that brings up burying it at the bottom of the sea. Yes, it certainly does get it out of our hair, but we couldn't very well retrieve it if we need to. So while it is waste, it's valuable waste. <laughs> so I'm not sure if that's quite the word that we should be using. Um, but one thing that was come to consensus on by the National Academy of Sciences in the 1950s um, and has been adopted uh, for use around the world is the concept of geologic storage. And why do we think about rocks and minerals when we think about geologic storage? Well, because it's permanent and long term. The Earth is 4.6 billion years old, for instance. Um, you can pick geologic locations that are stable, that are free of earthquakes and volcanoes. Um, and the idea is that even if the waste package were to fall apart over 10,000 to 1 million years, which is the time frames we're actually dealing with, then you could count on the surrounding geology to absorb the radioactive elements as they make their way through the environment. Um, and ultimately, you would minimize any exposure to a population center down the line. And the nice thing, if you will, about nuclear fuel or nuclear waste is that radioactivity, heat, and the toxicity of the fuel all decrease with time because the materials decay into something more stable. And so we count on multiple engineering as well as um, geological barriers. So this is what the United States has decided to do with its fuel. Ultimately, this is what all other countries who have nuclear programs are looking to do with their fuel. Um, Germany is looking to put theirs into a salt formation. France is looking to put theirs into a clay formation. Sweden is looking to put theirs into a granite formation. They all have their pros and cons, but this is what has kind of universally been agreed upon as the best way to deal with nuclear waste. And just to give you an idea of what it could look like inside of a nuclear waste repository, um, these canisters, which would be uh, made of steel essentially, uh, could hold our spent fuel bundles from a commercial reactor. These canisters would hold multiple high-level glass uh, high-level waste glass containers. Um, and then you could have shields, a drip shield to protect from water exposure, to protect from uh, falling rock or whatnot over long time periods. Oh, and this would be in a, this would be in a bored out tunnel underground, for instance. Well, this is not what we're currently doing with our US nuclear fuel, but I thought it was worth talking about because Yucca Mountain, as some of you may be familiar with, is probably one of the best characterized pieces of real estate on the entire face of this planet. <laughs> In the early to mid 80s, it was narrowed down as one of the possible locations that we could put our nation's high level nuclear waste and spent nuclear fuel. Um, in the desert of Nevada, here's Las Vegas, here's the Nevada test site. It's very close to the Nevada test site. It's on Nellis Air Force Base. And the rock type there is volcanic tuff. I have these bags of Yucca Mountain tuff, which is just a type of volcanic rock. It's ash that has been welded together. Um, feel free to open the bags, but that's the material that um, was a potential host for our nation's nuclear waste. Uh, Interestingly, the United States was going with a repository concept that's above the water table. The idea being if it's so high above the water table, it's pretty arid there, and you wouldn't have a lot of rainwater interacting with your waste that 
as it percolates through the rock so you could keep it isolated from the water table. Um, it drains to a closed basin. Uh, and then it borders the basin and range province, which is actually quite geologically active, which is one of the hot, uh, like contentious topics about Yucca Mountain. And it is in an arid oxidizing environment. Remember what happens to our cars in the winter when it interacts with um, water and oxygen and salts. The same thing happens to nuclear fuel. It turns that yellow color, and that's much more easy to dissolve in water than it is when it's that black uranium four plus. So, there are pros and cons to this site. I'm just here to tell you about what we were thinking. I put this timeline on there because that is not what we're thinking anymore as the best option, but this is just what it looks like. They used to have a visitor office in Las Vegas. This is the entrance to the big tunnel that nuclear waste would have brought, been brought in from all areas of the country via train, via truck, and it would be loaded into the mountain and there would be conduits um, off the side of the main tunnel, which is this. Um, but there are also young volcanics in the area, so this didn't make people very comfortable with our uh, selection of geologic site. Um, and the fact that it, it is in uh, welded tuff material meant that it had some sort of a volcanic history, even though that tuff did not come directly from this area. But so it was kind of an uphill battle uh, talking about the long-term stability of this location. Now, I put this up here just to show you the general distribution of nuclear waste, or sorry, nuclear um, power plants in the United States. There are currently 104 commercial plants in the US, and you can see that they're mostly on the eastern side of the country here. We have our Columbia generating station here, California has a few, Arizona has a few, but Nevada doesn't have any, <laughs> nor does uh, Wyoming, Utah, Idaho, et cetera. So, there's a long way for all these, um, all these spent, fuel, uh, spent fuel materials to be shipped if we were to have one repository in Nevada. And while Nevada does have a low population density, um, there are definitely issues of public acceptance when it came to siting a nuclear repository in that state. And you can see why, perhaps, since they don't have their own nuclear reactor there. So what's going on now? All that nuclear, spent nuclear fuel is sitting at different power plants throughout the United States. It's cooling in pools um, once it's reached its useful life. And it's not a scenario that we want to keep going on forever. Ultimately, we need to do something more permanent uh, with the fuel. This is a illustration of a, a, what we call an interim <laughs> solution, which is once the fuel has been sitting in the pool for a number of years, some up to 30 or 40 years, it can be removed because a lot of the heat has um, died off or has decayed away from the short-lived fission products. It can be dried and it can be stored in these naturally cooled um, casks that are made of concrete and would have enough shielding in them so that uh, people surrounding it wouldn't get um, any serious dose of radiation. So this is one way that we can buy ourselves more time before we settle upon a potential national repository or repositories. And um, this just shows that the spent fuel bundles would go in there. And this is something that the Blue Ribbon Commission that was commissioned by uh, President Obama and Secretary Chu has looked at and suggested as a possible short-term so solution to what we can do to help stabilize the nuclear fuel that's sitting in all these, um, at all these reactor sites across the country. So what does that mean for the future? If we don't have a Yucca Mountain, for instance, what would we be looking at? Something that's been proposed, again, by the Blue Ribbon Commission, but has come up in articles uh, such as in Science Magazine, is what if we went to the concept of regional repositories? This would eliminate the need for hauling uh, spent fuel from New York, for instance, all the way to Nevada. And it would be a little more balanced, if you will, um, since one state wouldn't be taking the entire nation's uh, nuclear waste. So uh, different regions of the country could ultimately host their own interim storage sites or their own um, 
geologic repositories because ultimately that would still be the plan. However, there is a lot of research going on at PNNL, for instance, related to the reprocessing of nuclear fuel and ways to make um, better nuclear waste forms. So while this is certainly one route we could go, it's not necessarily the only route that we have to go. So stay tuned, there's a lot more to be decided in the future, but definitely working with the public is something that's extremely important. And I will say that in um, New Mexico, there is a low level waste repository called WIP, Waste Isolation Pilot Plants. If you have like, um, like gloves and uh, like medical isotope material from hospitals that's been contaminated with um, low levels of radiation, it needs a place to go. This is an assault dome in the, oh, I didn't bring it out, in the deserts of New Mexico, kind of close to Carlsbad Caverns, if you guys have ever been down to see the caves down there. But this is a successfully operating uh, waste repository for um, low level radioactive waste. And I just put this up here because I want to illustrate the concept of geologic time, essentially. We talked about mining and using fuel in a reactor and storing it since the advent of nuclear energy, which came about um, after World War II. Um, and this is on the decadal time scale. But when we're talking about storing it safely, we have to consider hundreds to thousands to up to millions of years because that's how long it takes for the radioactivity to decay away. So this is our human solution to how to best deal with this really long-term stuff that we're not gonna be around to see um, the ultimate fate of, either for our children or our children's children. So, that brings me to the end of the whole nuclear reactor, nuclear fuel cycle portion of things. But I really wanted to pay homage to such a unique piece of history that we have here in the Tri-Cities. B-Reactor, we actually have a docent for B-Reactor in the audience, which is pretty cool. <laughs> um, whoops, wrong way. And has everyone or anyone been on the tour to see B-Reactor in the audience? I see a few hands. I know that, or a good number of hands actually, that's great. I know that the, um, the tour dates for this year were open at midnight. I know a few folks who were up at midnight to book their, their spot on the tour. And clearly there's a demand to see the world's first industrial scale nuclear reactor because all those seats were filled up by 1230 I'm hearing. So that's pretty impressive. So there's a demand to go see it a pretty impressive piece of nuclear history. And looking at B reactor, what's missing compared to our regular in, like energy generating nuclear reactors? Any? <laughs> yeah, and what do we usually see associated with that? The cooling tower, like think of the Simpsons, right? <laughs> the big cooling tower. So. The purpose of B reactor, as you know, was not to create electricity, it was to create plutonium. And I went on the B reactor tour as a summer intern at PNNL, and um, I was amazed, this is not my picture, but I was just amazed by the fact that you could walk up to see the front of the reactor core where they slid in the uranium fuel rod slugs. And, to me, it looked like a big Rubik's Cube. <laughs> but I love the stories that are told about um, how they were able to overcome the xenon buildup. And it's just such a fantastic feat of human engineering that I'm proud that it's in our backyard. Um, and what those scientists did under that pressure at the end of World War II is just amazing to think how they went from the theory that material could fission to Enrico Fermi's pile underneath the squash courts as it goes in University of Chicago to a full industrially sized nuclear reactor that was capable of producing plutonium um, within a very short time frame is pretty awesome. But it wasn't the first. And this is what I was talking about on the flyer. Um, the Earth had them beat by about two billion years, no offense, Enrico family <laughs> or anything like that. But um, I just wanted to talk about a really kind of cool example of nuclear fission and Earth history. Um, has anyone ever been to Gabon, Africa? 
<laughs> For real, Dr. Braley? <laughs> I'm impressed. You'll have to tell me your stories. <laughs> but um, so in the 1970s, uh, France was mining for its uranium supply, and uh, they accessed the uranium resources that were in the country of Gabon, Africa. And just so you guys know, uh, there's a great article, like an introduction to what actually happened there by Dr. Alex Meshik um, in Scientific American. Um, and there's a great website that details the history of what went on there. So um, I encourage you to take a look at that. But this is how the story goes. In the 1970s, the French miners uh, brought back uraninite, the UO2, from Africa to be refined uh, in France to make nuclear fuel for their reactors. France operates 70% of its electricity comes from nuclear fuel. Uh, so it's pretty heavy into nuclear. But as I said before, um, that you have your uranium-238 that's greater than 99% in nature. In fact, uh, U-235, the fissionable kindling material for our fission reaction, is only 0.72% of natural uranium. But what they were finding back in their lab is that the uranium from Oaklo was 0.717-235. So they ruled out any foul play, and they said, wait a second, could it be that this material actually fissioned somehow in Earth's history. And as, as I was reading an article, um, it wasn't long after the advent of nuclear power that um, a scientist, uh, his name was Paul Kuroda, actually came up with a theory that maybe fission could have occurred in nature. Um, at a time when there was a greater amount of uranium-235. He just did not have an example of a fission, of a location, a uranium mine where this could have happened. So it was in the back of people's minds, but it certainly wasn't um, proven. And when the, they found the depleted uranium-235, they started looking more carefully at um, the uranium deposit at Oklo. This is just a picture of what they call one of their reactor zones, where they identified fission as occurring. Um, there's a person for scale. Uh, but there's these little pods within this uranium deposit at Oklo that actually had sustained fission over two billion years ago. How do we know that? We know that because there's fission products that exist in the minerals surrounding uh, these deposits, and they could only have formed by the splitting of uranium atoms. Um, there's things like xenon gas uh, that was trapped in aluminum phosphates, for instance. And so there's just undeniable signatures that nuclear fission had occurred. And so how would this happen, you might ask? Because I'll tell you, it cannot happen in nature today. And the fact is, Earth was a little different back then. If you take a deep breath now, you'll be revived by the oxygen that's in the air. However, if you took a deep breath three billion years ago, you would have been choking for oxygen because there just was not a lot of free oxygen in Earth's atmosphere. In fact, 2.5 billion years ago is when we started to see the appearance of oxidized iron materials or iron minerals appear significantly in the geologic record. So uh, 2.5 billion years ago, things like algal mats started producing oxygen as a, a waste product um, from their activities, and it slowly accumulated in the, in the atmosphere. Why is it important? Because you can have all the uranium you want sitting at the surface of the Earth, but unless it oxidizes, dissolves in water, and then gets deposited downstream, you're not going to accumulate it in one place. So you needed oxygen to mobilize uranium in the environment. Also, here's the kicker. Um, the concentration of uranium-235, if you were to mine a uraninite uh, deposit two billion years ago, it would have been about 3% relative to the 0.7% that it is today. This is because uranium-235 has a shorter half-life than uranium-238. So back then, two billion years ago, there was more of it, and it decays at a faster rate than uranium-238. So you had a greater 235 to 238 ratio. So it's kind of cool to think about um, things that we kind of think is constants 
are not necessarily constants when we look at geologic time. So this is what the best working theory is for what happened at Oklo. So here, this rock label number four would be our source of uranium. It, it, there's a granite uh, bedrock in that area. So ultimately, um, 3.5 billion years ago, you had this granite formation that formed. And then as oxygen became more available in the atmosphere, Rainwater interacted um, with this material. It oxidized some of the uranium that's in the rock naturally, and it began to leach it out, and the uranium was mobilized in the environment. And at that time, this, um, this geologic setting, uh, which is an extensional setting, so it's filling in with sediments, uh, started to accumulate something like sandstones and shales, which are uh, medium to very fine-grained rocks. And this uranium was deposited in those formations. And then ultimately, you got enough uranium accumulated in these deposits that they went critical meaning that the uranium-235 was kicking, was decaying naturally and shooting off neutrons that were absorbed by neighboring uranium-235 atoms enough to uh, sustain a chain reaction. And since that time, since they stopped operating, um, then we just have uranium and the fission products interacting with environmental conditions. So like I said before, we had a higher 235 to 238 ratio back then. Um, water was present as a moderator in this geologic deposit. And in a nuclear reactor, you do need something to slow the neutrons down so that your uranium atoms can absorb them. So here we had an example of a system that was naturally moderated. And also, the size and shape of the uranium deposits were such that if a neutron was ejected by the breaking apart of uranium-235 atom, um, there was enough length and width of the uranium deposit that it would be absorbed by another uranium atom. So all the things came together <laughs> naturally to be able to sustain um, miniature nuclear reactor pods, essentially. And <coughs> What I found was interesting is that they say, based on um, looking at the elements that were pr produced, they can calculate how much energy essentially was generated by these reactors. But um, they also know that they didn't run for like 100 years at a time. They ran intermittently. You had to have water in there. And like a geyser would, you know, the water goes down. It gets heated up by an internal heat source. It bubbles, and then it comes to the surface. Essentially, similar things happen. You'd have to have enough water accumulate in this deposit such that it could slow down the neutrons, at which point the fission reaction could occur. And then it would get so hot that the water would boil off, and then it would stop the reaction from happening. So they think for a number of years, uh, while the conditions were right, on and off, these reactors operated. And my favorite line from the paper I read was with respect to the question of, so how much, or how much energy was produced by these reactors? And what that it was enough, elect enough energy that it could power a few dozen toasters. <laughs> <laughs> which I just think was such a funny unit of measure. <laughs> so they basically calculated the number of kilowatt um, hours that could have been generated by these little reactor pods. And it really isn't that much electricity when you think about it, but the fact that all these conditions came together to, to demonstrate fission reaction in a natural environment is pretty amazing. So what's the benefit of a uranium deposit like Oklo. Well, Oklo is so unique because it actually did go critical um, in geologic time. And because those materials, those uranium materials um, and the fission products have been sitting in nature for the past two billion years, we have an amazing laboratory for looking at the fate of uranium as well as other nuclear byproducts in the environment. So that we can learn a lot about the long-term behavior of nuclear fuel, which we can never simulate in a laboratory because we don't live long enough. <laughs> but that's what we need to know because we're talking about storing fuel on the time periods of millions of years. This dark line here is the radioactivity of mined uranium ore. So you can see that it takes a long time for our nuclear fuel to return to that level of radioactivity.
and then one more time with the toasters, because, <laughs> yes? In, in geologic terms, yes. is a million years significant? Geologically, no. Uh, we play plus or minus 10,000 to millions of years a lot. But when we're talking about can we make an engineered barrier system to last that amount of time, we can't put the same kind of certainty on that that we can on something within like a 100 time year frame. So geologically, no, but for people, it's important. <laughs> and I'll just end with this final slide um, that shows electricity consumption on the bottom and what we call the human well-being index on the left, which has to do with life expectancy and education and all kinds of things. You can see that a number of the industrialized nations use a significant amount of kilowatt hours per year. And you know how much electricity that we use here in the United States alone. Um, both to power our homes, buildings, and, and to drive our cars around. But look at the number of countries that are still living below this line of, um, of certain life expectancies and, and education levels. Um, and in order to give people the opportunity, we definitely, to have better lives, we definitely need a variety of energy resources that ideally aren't carbon dioxide emitting. So, that's why it's so important that we work towards helping nuclear be a key component of that energy mix for the future. And with that, uh, I want to thank you. I'm happy to take any questions you might have on this Tuesday evening. And I want to thank Megan and PNNL for organizing this Community Science Technology Seminar Series, and also the Mid-Columbia Kennewick branch of the libraries for giving us a space to come together tonight. So thank you very much. Thank you.